going to be reading it uh, from the screen or otherwise you can follow in your Bible. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there. Jesus answered, are there no twelve hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by, by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he, um, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but the disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plain, uh, plainly, Lazarus, he's dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I'm not, uh, I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Deatimus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we, may, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in a tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comf comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have, would not have died. But I know that even, though, even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last days. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, whom was to come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at, pla at, at, at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforted her, notice how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in the spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not, be, could, could, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone that laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, 
By this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. And Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with stripes of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. May the Lord bless to our heart the reading of his word. Have you ever asked yourself the question, the question does God really cares? Does God really cares? God, if you care, you would have dot, 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 fill in the blanks. God, do you really care about me? I know there are probably people in this room who have the same question laying heavily upon their heart. Does God really care? And maybe you can go ahead and believe that maybe there is a God in heaven, but how do you know that he really cares about you? Fortunately for us, the scriptures are not silent on this question. Where are they? And the story about the raising of Lazarus in, chapter, in John chapter 11, I believe speaks deeply to the way that God really does care. I've often thought, you know, there are a lot of amazing things that happen in the Bible that would have been really cool to have been a part of that day, to literally be there on that day. I mean, think of, think of Moses parting the Red Sea. I would have loved to have seen that personally. That seems fairly dramatic and I would have loved to have seen it. But out of all the stories in the Bible, if there is one that I could sit back and hopefully have a front row seat and a front row audience to, I believe it will be this story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Because there are some amazing things that will happen there. And there are other things that, yes, Jesus did raise Lazarus from the dead. And I think that that was truly miraculous. But I wish I could have seen everything that happened on that day. Or I might wish I could have at least had a conversation with the person who wrote down the story of what he saw happen on that day. Often people tell me that I'm pretty good at telling stories of the Bible. So I thought today maybe I would use my imagination and do something a little bit different. And try and tell the story as if I was really there on that day. So you have to put in your imaginary cap on. So this is now me back then. I look good for my age, hey? People ask me all the time what I saw that day when Jesus raised the boy Lazarus from the dead. And I will tell you exactly what I tell everyone else who asks me. Was it a miracle that he could raise that kid from the dead? Absolutely, of course. But the real miracle, the miracle that matters most to us, happened much earlier in that day. And the sad thing is that often people don't read what I wrote down when I saw and they count of what I saw. And I pray this morning, as I tell you the story as I wrote it down, that you won't make the same mistake. You see, it has been a really intense week leading up to the time where Jesus raised Lazarus. Jesus was always in a fight with those Pharisees. They were always out there trying to, to trap him and get him. And it's kind of a build up to this crescendo moment where Jesus looked at them and he said, I and the Father are one. Now I don't know if you know that, but stop and think about it for a second. Can you imagine saying that? I 
and God the Father are one? Can you imagine if you heard someone else say that? What would you think? He's claiming to be God. Well, no sooner had those words passed his lips, the Pharisees were bent over to pick up stones the size of a grapefruit, and they were about to kill Jesus with them. You see, this was not a playful thing that he said. We knew we had to get out of there. They wanted to kill Jesus, and they wouldn't have mind to kill us as well. And so we ran. We ran far away and we got away and we went to this remote place across the river Jordan where John had been. We knew we had to lay low for a while. So we were there and we were sitting around one day when we got the news about Lazarus. Ah, he would have loved Lazarus. He was one of those fun and funny and energetic kind of, kind of guy full of life. What a kid. And his family, I mean his sister, Mary and Martha. Jesus absolutely adored them. So on top of the fact that we, we have these guys who want to kill us, we hear the news that Lazarus is hanging by thread with his life. He is sick and he will die any moment. At the request, he's, they're requesting Jesus to come and visit. And the request is, Jesus, will you come and help him? Well, there's a big problem. See, the problem is Lazarus lives in Judea, in the heart of where the Pharisees are waiting for Jesus. And to go back there will mean that we could die. It was almost like a suicide mission. So we all looked at Jesus. What are we going to do? Well, Jesus looked at us and he said, the sickness will not end in death. Well, that's all he said. And for me, I was, I was ready to go. I was, I was the youngest and I was ready to go at not cost. I was, I was invincible with Jesus by my side. And I thought, well, let's go back. We'll be fine. We can get away from these guys. So I was ready to go and Jesus looked at me calmly and he said, relax. And I'm thinking to myself, relax? Jesus, did you not just hear the news? We have to get now to Lazarus. His life depends on it. But not only did we not leave that day, the next day I was ready to go and Jesus said, stay. The second day came. And by now I'm thinking to myself, there is no way Lazarus is alive anymore. I looked at Jesus on the second day and Jesus said, time to go. And I'm thinking, why in the world would we do that? I mean, it's one thing to risk your life for someone who is hanging in a thread. It's another trying to risk your life for someone who is already dead. So we argued. And all of us argued over it. Some wanted to stay and some said, let's go. And we were afraid. But Jesus was insistent and he said, let's go. Finally, Thomas looked at us and said, if he's going to die, then we will all go with him to die. So we got up and we crossed the Jordan and we began what I was convinced was a death march. I don't know how we did it, but somehow we made our way and we made it safely to the place where Lazarus had died. He had been dead for four days by the time we arrived. And as we were coming up, we looked out on the road in front of us and in the distance on that dirt road we saw this kind of a, a plum of dust and this figure was coming on our way. I knew at once who it was. You see, she had that kind of a walk with this confidence in her stride. It was Martha, Lazarus' sister. She walked straight up to Jesus, didn't look at us, did not look at anybody else. She walked up to Jesus and she went toe to toe with him, eye to eye with him, which by the way, a woman in those days just doesn't do that. But Martha did. She looked Jesus square in the eyes and said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. See, Martha always had a way of telling it like it was. And I loved it for I loved her for it. Then she said to Jesus, But I know that even now and you could ask, 
and God will give you whatever you ask. It was kind of a day that Martha was daring Jesus. So Jesus, we've seen you do all kinds of things before. Are you going to do this thing for our brother? Well, Jesus just looked at her and said, Martha, your brother will rise again. You know, the great thing about Martha was she was one of those people who always posed for clarity and always pushed for clarity. Don't you love those people? They don't just check an answer. They want to know exactly what you mean by it. So Martha looked at Jesus and said, I know, I know my brother will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. In other words, is that what you are saying, Jesus? Is that what I will see him in heaven? Now get ready, because this is the beginning of the miracle that I wanted to tell you about, that many people miss what I wrote down on that day. Jesus looked at her and said these words, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believed in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Did you get it? I am I mean, our ears all went like this when we heard this word, I am. The sacred word. Every Jewish boy knew the story. I was one of those. I knew the story. I knew the heroes. I knew especially Moses. Moses, who one day was walking in the desert, tending to his sheep, and saw a bush that was on fire, and that bush spoke to him and a voice came out so he walked towards this bush terrified and he asked the bush knowing that it was God who are you and he got two words in return I am and I stood there looking at this man who I had spent time with who was using these words to describe himself I am Yahweh you were not allowed to say those words. It was sacred. It was holy. And when I wrote this, this encounter, when I wrote it down in my book, I wrote the word Echo Eme, which in Greek means I myself am. But I put an emphasis. Make no mistakes who I, who I am is. And people ask me sometimes, you spend all this time with Jesus, did you really think he was God? I'm telling you, he didn't think he was God, he knew it. And as soon as those words that came out of his mouth saying, I am, it was the great I am that stood in front of us. And if you read what I wrote down and you read the rest of the scripture, there is no other options available. This was not a good teacher we wandered around with. This was the most powerful person in the universe. This was the creator of the universe. This was in the beginning God. This was the I am. That was the beginning of the miracle. Because if you think about what you would do if you had all that power, and as I think about what I would do, I started to think what I might become. And what did he choose to do? The great I am, the author of our life, the Alpha and Omega, he put on skin and fingernails and hair and took on pain and became one of us. That was the beginning of that miracle on that day. But it wasn't long when we, we looked down the same road and we saw another plum of dust coming towards Jesus. This figure was, was far different. And we knew at once who it was. It was Mary. Martha was so great because she was just such a force. But you see, Mary, oh, Mary was beautiful. And, and she came, she was so gentle and tender. And she walked up to Jesus and we could see in her eyes that she's been crying for days now her lips sort of quiver her face was blotchy she looked at Jesus and she said in a tender voice Lord 
if he had only been here earlier, my brother would have died, would not have died. Same exact words that Martha had used, right? Clearly they have been practicing and rehearsing together what will they say to Jesus when he comes. No sooner had she said that then she collapsed sobbing at Jesus' feet. Now here is a second part of the miracle then. Don't miss it. I looked at Jesus' face and he looked down at Mary and then he looked up to Martha who was standing there. And he saw the people wailing and suffering. And then he looked me in the eyes and he saw the tears that were in my own eyes. We all loved Lazarus. He was such a character. Oh, you would have loved him. I saw Jesus' face grow red. And his eyes began to fall. And his breath, breathing started changing. He threw back his head. And, and when, when he brought, for, well, brought it forward again, his eyes exploded with tears. He reached down and he grabbed Mary and Jesus wept. Jesus wept. The tears rolling down his cheeks into his beard dripped off and it ended up in this dirt and almost became little pools of mud on the ground. I looked in front of me and I saw the man he had said, I and the Father am one. He used the word, the sacred word of I am Yahweh. And this man, this creator of the universe, now was weeping. Now that's a miracle. All the gods we could have gotten, we got this God who walked among us and cried and wept with us. Well, I watched for a second and the crying stopped and Jesus stood up. We wonder what now? What is he going to do now? I looked in his face and I saw a different emotion. It was an emotion that I've seen it before and honestly, I wasn't quite expecting it in this kind of scenario. I'd seen him a few weeks earlier in the temple when he walked in and saw the people were being cheated. He took the tables in the temple and he threw them upside down and in his anger flashed in his eyes. And as I looked into Jesus' eyes now and I saw his lips curl and his eyes starting to squint, I thought, oh boy, Jesus is angry. When you get incredible love mixed with that kind of power and anger, you get compassionate action. You know, it reminded me of when I wrote it down, this is all that I could think of. It reminded of me when I was a little boy in my village, and one day the Romans would come in and, and, and they've just been in a battle and they would come in. And I remember this one day seeing this soldier sitting on this horse and the horse was huge. And I looked into the eyes of the horse and it was wild and fierce and I could tell it had been to battle. When I wrote down the words to describe what I saw in Jesus that day, I used the exact same word as the war horse I've seen. Jesus was ready to fight. See, he walked forward up to the tomb with a boy who has been behind the tomb dead for four days. And he said, take the stone away. Well, nobody moved. Everybody is thinking nothing is going to come out of there, Jesus. Well, maybe something is going to come out of stench. A real bad odor. I mean, he has been there for four days in a hot cave. Jesus was insistent and he said, move the stone. Well, about then, three of the or four guys came up and they rolled this rock away. And I tell you, there was this, not much of a crack before this waves of stench came out of the tomb. Have you ever, ever smelled something so bad that it makes your eyes burn? I had to close my eyes and plug my nose and I was trying not to breathe this awful smell. I squinted to look up and all I saw was Jesus. 
the I am, the Emmanuel, the God with us, staring into the face of the most foul, base element of humanity, death. And was not even blinking. He just stared into that cave. He looked up to heaven and said, God, I'm praying to you. You know, because I know you always hear me, but I'm praying for the benefit of those people around me so that they will know the authority that you have given to me. It's for their benefit, God. And he stared again into that tomb, and he said in a voice that echoed like thunder, Lazarus, come out. There are no words to describe what it's like to see a beloved child who has been dead walk out of a tomb. But it happened. You can't describe the look of Mary's face or Martha or Lazarus' mom who was also there. For me, I tell you this, I was not surprised. I had seen Jesus do so many things before. In a way, the moment was an anticlimax for me. It was a miracle, don't get me wrong, but the real miracle had happened early in that day when I realized the man that was walking with me was not only God in the flesh, but he wept with us. Does God care? You bet he does. You see, that is the miracle of the story, and I pray that you don't miss it. You know, it's amazing that you hear the story, that maybe you've heard the story so many times before, maybe a hundred of times before, maybe you've heard sermons about this. How I can open our ears to new parts of the message that you have might, might have missed otherwise. Now, when I studied theology at Varsity, one of the things that taught me to do was to read and translate the ancient Greek text of the New Testament. And I had a class where one of the tasks set before us was to translate John chapter 11 into Greek. From, I mean, from Greek to English. And as I sat down to do that, I worked through it, and I stumbled across something in verse 33 that when I looked at the actual Greek word chosen and all the possible meanings, I realized what was recorded in the modern Bible didn't seem to capture the fullness of what the real meaning of that word was. So in chapter 11, verse 33, to put you in the context of where we were in the story, this is right when Jesus had seen Mary approaches him. She has come weeping and she is surrounded by a bunch of other mourners who are weeping with her. And if you read the NIV version, it will say that Jesus' response was this. It says, he was deeply moved in the spirit and troubled. But as I look and I looked at the word that was actually in there, I realized there is an enormous understatement for how Jesus responded when he saw them. One commentator that I read on this passage said that the word indicates an outburst of anger and any attempt to reinterpret in terms of internal, emotional, upset caused by grief, pain or sympathy is just illegitimate. So that's the idea you need to grasp. In this moment, Jesus is not just sad or grieving. Jesus is extremely angry. And not just like an anger that he keeps in a kind of a shaking kind of anger. In this outburst of anger that everyone can see. It's the image of Jesus flies into the face of how I generally think of Jesus. And I'm a, I myself am guilty of allowing myself to develop this mental image of Jesus who likes ultimate nice guy, meek and mild. He's very serene. He talks with this kind of a mellow voice. 
It's kind of a sing-song kind of voice in my mind. He sort of nods his head and understandingly a lot. He's like sort of like, "Mm mm-hmm, yeah. But it's hard, isn't it? I get this therapeutic vision of Jesus in my head and here in this text we are confronted with something very, very different. This is a Jesus who is absolutely fighting mad. Which begs a real important question. Why is Jesus responding in that way? That's not the average response when you attend a funeral, is it? So my personal experience led me to have some thoughts on why Jesus responded this way. Have you ever had to live with fear in your life of a sickness in your life? That you ask yourself the question, is this the day that it's going to happen? Is this the day that it's going to happen? Well, this was God's anger that we live in a world where there are diseases that can put you in this position. Because we do have a God who knows that was not the way that was intended to When I was at Varsity, you had to learn a lot of these kind of really kind of highfalutin kind of theological terms, these big words. And actually, is a theological phrase to describe God's response when Jesus looked at Mary and her fellow mourners and became so angry. You could say that Jesus goes all mama bear on them. If you've ever spent some time in the woods, you know that one place, the worst place in any wilderness to be, is between a mother bear and her cubs. Because she will become immediately enraged and ready to do anything that she can do to protect her cubs. When Jesus gets angry in the story like that, and he has this huge outburst. And I believe that is why. Because he lays his eyes on his beloved daughter, Mary. And he sees her brokenness. And he sees her weeping. And he's not okay with the world and the system that put her in that situation. He's not okay with it. Because that's not how he created it. We made it that way. We sinned. The world is fallen from his grace. And what I like maybe the most about Jesus is that he never lets things rest just like the way they are. His anger drives action. And he does two things. He weeps. And secondly, he calls Lazarus out of the tomb from death back into life. So if you ask yourself the question, does God really care? Maybe you need to look into his eyes today and see him weep for you and for your circumstance. But then, raise your eyes to see his eyes and hear him say, rise up and get out of your situation and walk with me. Amen. We're going to be going to time of communion. So can I ask the elders on duty to come and help me?